G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel today, taking a look at uh, the first round of match simulation games. The preseason is officially, uh, well, the preseason games have officially started. They might not be actually proper sanctioned games, so there was no statistics. I guess the point of this video is that I kind of noticed the results and, and all the information about the games that happened uh, across the last weekend. It's all a little bit diffuse. You have to really go looking for it. Uh, hard to find highlights. The highlights are grainy of the ones that you do find. So in today's video, I'm just going to take you through each of the results that happened and a few talking points from each game. It's good to have football back. I attended uh, the Eagles game at Lathlane or Minerals Resources as it's known now. Uh, and it's just great to have footy back, to be honest. It's still pretty bloody hot here in Western Australia, but Either way, footy's officially back. We've got another round of preseason fixtures this weekend, which will all be, um, I believe there'll be stats recorded and stuff like that. So those are the official games. So the last weekend were the unofficial games. I'm going to take you through all the little things that happened that you may have missed. Been a little bit quiet on the channel uh, over the last week or so, or at least more quiet than I have intended to be this preseason. Life's a little bit crazy right now. I'm going to do a video soon to explain it. You might have caught the podcast I did with Druzy where I talk a little bit about the changes happening in my life right now, but I'll do another video to explain that. But it's been a long week and I'm finally ready to sit down with a coffee and talk about some footy with you all. So we had eight fixtures take place on the weekend. The only two teams that didn't play in a proper sort of inter-club game were the Giants and Dogs. They held their own intra-club. So I don't really have anything to report on those games in particular. So we're going to talk about the eight uh, that actually involved two teams competing. This video, of course, is brought to you by Jeruzzi's Athlete Academy. If you're a young athlete who wants to take his game to the next level with some professional online coaching and some structured regimes to take your game to the next level, Jeruzzi's Athlete Academy could be the option for you. It's not just for athletes. You could just be someone, a young person trying to improve their fitness or, you know, get into the gym, or perhaps you've noticed you've been going to the gym for a while and starting to stagnate. Druzy offers professional programs that can be customized to your specific needs. So the cool thing about that is this, if you use my discount code TRUE4020, you get 20% off on any program that you decide to purchase. It's a good idea to invest in yourself, guys. Getting fit is a great way to start. But anyway, let's talk about the football games that took place over the last few days. Uh, as I said, there were eight. I think it's really important that we always need to remember to temper our expectations with preseason games. There's so many variables at play here. We've got players underdone who have been building for round one, not to be fit and firing for the first preseason game. We've got a lot of rotations happening, a lot of young players exposed to new roles, lots of players on managed minutes and stuff like that as well. So I think it's important to say you shouldn't take too much out of the results that take place, but we can still talk about the things that or at least in my opinion, were meaningful out of each game. So we'll start with Collingwood playing Carlton at Icon Park. The result in the end was Carlton won the game by 10 minutes. And the first thing that caught my eye about this game is that Carlton apparently had 13 players missing due to injury. So the fact that they actually got up and had a win over Collingwood, even though it's a preseason game, I think that's a positive to take out of it. I don't think it's necessarily an indictment on Collingwood. But regardless, it was a competitive fixture. A lot of key players missing and Carlton were able to um, at least play a brand of football that was going going to win a game. So it sounds like the new recruit in Billy Frampton, who's been recruited from the Crows as a key defender, kind of struggled. But to be fair, he's coming up against the, probably the two best key forwards in the competition, or close to anyway. I think Harry Mackay had a bit of a day out, kicked three goals in the first quarter. Chera and Hewitt were reportedly uh, pretty productive in the midfield, and I think those two will need to have a good start to the season. So that's an important uh, note, because Sam Walsh is going to be missing the first month of the season with a back injury as well. I think Patrick Cripps had an injury scare during this game. He limped off the field, but the Blues are downplaying the severity of that injury, and who knows whether that's legit, but hopefully he's okay for round one. As for the Pies, it would have been exciting to see Dan McStay and Bobby Hill uh, as new recruits in that forward line, and apparently they both played well in patches, and those will be particularly McStay, an important structural key piece for them uh, in this season going forward. They've kind of lacked that key forward presence. They've got one now, so it was good to see him line up for the Pies for the first time. There was a couple of positional uh, quirks in this game. Dugowie played the first half as a mid, that's not necessarily uh, strange. But interestingly, Taylor Adams played as a deep forward for large periods of this game. So I've got no idea. I'm not close enough to the situation to know if that's indicative of him playing more as a forward this season. It seems a little bit surprising to me. Perhaps he's just getting a few kilometers in the legs. The role of Nick Dacos will be an interesting one for uh, for anyone to watch, whether you're a Collingwood fan uh, or just a fan of Nick Dacos, or perhaps if you're a fantasy fan wanting to know where Nick Dacos is going to be playing his footy this year, it sounds like he was evenly split between the mids and the backs as well. So I think regardless, he's a good fantasy option. 
As for the young guns, uh, apparently Oliver Hollands uh, came in and played pretty well in his first crack as a blue. He kicked a, a good goal, and considering Carlton's injury problems at the moment, he might be a chance for round one as well. Moving on to the next game, and Sydney played Brisbane at uh, a place called Moore Park and got smashed by 45 points. The Lions ended up winning 99-54, to 54, and we saw a lot of new faces for the Brisbane Lions uh, t- um, take the field, and I think that would be one of the interesting parts of this game is, you know, heaps of new recruits joined the Lions some big names, Josh Dunkley, Gunston, and of course Will Ashcroft as well. And pleasingly for the Lions, Gunston played really well, kicked three goals from five shots on goal. Dunkley played a little bit of midfield, played a little bit of forward as well. He kicked two himself, and Will Ashcroft is being described as one of the best players on the field in the game. Gunston, Hipwood, and Danaher worked pretty well as a unit, and I think this could be a bit of a scary prospect for opposition sides as well. Obviously, Danaher was a big key forward recruit. They've added now Gunston, who's a nice foil to those other types as well. So there's some genuine scoring power in that Brisbane Lions forward line, and that's just the tolls. We haven't even talked about Charlie Cameron. Lockie Neal apparently had a bit of an injury scare. There was a dislocated finger in a Cork, so it sounds like it was a painful game for him, but again, apparently taking him off was precautionary, so it shouldn't be too concerning. In terms of positional changes, Cam Rayner uh, had his first crack in a game as a halfback, which is an interesting new role for him, obviously more of a midfielder forward. They're putting him behind the footy where he can uh, perhaps use his damaging skill, uh, so that will be an interesting one to watch this season too. As for the Swans, I don't know how much to really take out of this game. Obviously, I'm not really too concerned. They lost the preseason game by 45 points, rotated their players heavily. Buddy only came on in the second half or something, or only played a half anyway. Didn't see much of it because they got rolled. Uh, the Hickey and McLean missed, so a few uh, key position players, particularly in the rucks, they were a little bit undermanned. Nothing overly reportable, I think, other than the fact that Golden, Heaney, and Row Bottom uh, were mentioned as being quite prominent, although that shouldn't be a surprise by now. Then we'll talk about the real blockbuster of this week's games. West Coast beat Port Adelaide by eight points at Mineral Resources Park. As I said, I went down. It was a nice afternoon, and it felt strange to see us win. It's been a little while, Um, so I think there was a bit of a morale boost uh, for Eagles fans and players alike. I think preseason or not, it's nice to have a win always, uh, and it's nice to have it legitimized and confirm that we are going to win the premiership this year. In all seriousness, uh, Port were the better side for the first half. The Eagles sort of got on... Uh, got on top in patches, the power dominated the ruck, as you'd expect. There was no Nick Nat, so Lysett sort of uh, had his way, so to speak, with Bailey Williams and Jamison, who are young and they'll be fine, but their superior midfielders won them the ball and they set up really well, and it was hard for the Eagles to really break through. Once, you know, Boke obviously got injured during the game, and then I think we saw less of Wines. Uh, once those prime mids stopped playing, uh, that's where the Eagles sort of got on top. So again, from a Port Adelaide perspective, reading online, they seem pretty dark that they lost this game. There's a bit of a stigma about losing to West Coast, uh, as you can expect as well, but I don't think it was too much of a big deal. Horn Francis was an interesting one. He attended more center bounces than any other player on the field, and there was a couple of times where he really opened up the play with some nice angled kicks as well. So he'll be an interesting one to watch, and I guess it's interesting to me that he's they sort of intend to use him as a uh, on-baller full-time, not so much a forward who drifts through the midfield uh, that Plenty of time on ball was an interesting development for me anyway. From an Eagles perspective, um, I think it's still clear we've seen a much different side to last year. It's vastly improved. The fact that we, you know, didn't lose by 100 points, uh, but actually won the game, I think that speaks for itself because we would not have won this game, you know, 12 months ago. But it was nice to see some of the... the, uh the guns back in the side who missed a lot of footy last year. Allen played well as the sole, you know, key target. Sheed came in and played well. Yo was one of our best on ground, if not the best. And Liam Ryan also uh, looks like he could be in all Australian form, uh, or at least as fit as he was in the year that he won uh, his all Australian jumper as well. So I'm hoping that translates to an actual all Australian jumper. Elijah Hewitt came on and looked fantastic with a few times he touched the ball, like kicked a really nice goal. And Campbell Chesser finally played a full game of football as well. So some exciting signs from a West Coast perspective. Junior Rioli also played uh, for the power as well. Got booed, unfortunately. I think that's lame as hell. But anyway, kicked a couple of goals out the back, and it's uh, power now have this exciting forward dynamic. Orazio's back in the side. Junior Rioli's in that team. And as I said, Horn Francis can play forward, as can Rosie, obviously. So there's some real danger in that Port Adelaide forward line suddenly. As I said, both got injured. Uh, got, you know, I think need in the back. I only saw it in real time, and I have no idea. I know Anthony the pair is a bit dirty about what happened. I, I didn't really see it, to be honest. But either way, I think he's been sent for scans and has been cleared of structural damage as well, which is good news for Port fans and Anthony in particular. Next, we'll talk about the Cats and the Hawks who played at GMHBA. And um, as you'd expect this game to go in real life, or at least in my opinion, 
the, the Cats won by 85 points. So a bit of a rout. Uh, they did play 19 premiership players across, um, you know, as I, these games are a little bit longer. And by the way, I'm only recording the scores as they finished at, um, at the end of four quarters. Uh, anything after that, uh, there's probably no point really including because it was kind of reserves and, and VFL and waffle players playing. But anyway, good news for the Cats. Oliver Henry came in and kicked four goals uh, in his first outing for his new club. Jeremy Cameron kicked four goals. Nothing really surprising about that. Bose and Bruin apparently played quite well in the midfield. Jack Henry also kicked two, but he's done an ankle and we're unsure as it stands, I think, the extent of that injury. So that will be one to watch. Stengel kicked three. Again, no surprise. Ollie Dempsey kicked three. So that might be a notable one for Cats fans. Not going to lie, no idea who Ollie Dempsey is, but the fact that he kicked three goals is pretty promising as well. The other positional change for the Cats that uh, might be of some interest is that Max Holmes played as an inside mid, you know, traditionally more of a, uh, I think he's been playing on the wing, a bit forward as well, extremely fast, but he's got some inside craft now as well. So that might be a bit of a an answer to the Joel Selwood um missing piece, so to speak. Obviously, Bose and Brun will also be competing for that spot as well. But if Holmes has another dimension as an inside mid, then that's really good news for Cats fans. As for the Hawks, I don't really know how much to take away from this. I think anytime you lose a game by 85 points, it's disappointing, but they are playing against the reigning premiers. And apparently, Josh Ward played well in the uh, in, as an inside mid, and Will Day also played predominantly as an inside mid. He's been earmarked for a, a more full-time midfield role as well. So that will be an interesting to watch. Very, very talented player. Dylan Moore kicked three goals. Again, we already know he's a gun. And Josh Weddle, uh, the draftee, the one they... I think they traded for him. I can't. Yeah, I think they traded up for Josh Weddle. Um, sort of drafted as a tall defender, earmark for a midfield role. Anyway, long story short, came on and played predominantly in a wing position, which is uh, somewhat interesting. North Melbourne also played Richmond last week at Arden Street, and this one was a bit of a thriller with the Tigers eventually prevailing by just the two points. And you expect naturally that this game would have not been as close if it was in the uh, regular season, but I believe the Tigers rotated their plays heavily, as you can imagine. So in terms of bright sparks from this game, Harry Sheasel was one of the standouts, kicked a couple of early goals, and I think he kicked a third one later on and also rotated through the midfield as well. So again, one of the rising star candidates for me, absolute gun Harry Sheasel, was taken with pick three, I think, of, um, but when it was all said and done. Bit of a Stevie J type. He would be a really interesting candidate this year. Griffin Lowe played his first game for his new club as well. Bit underdone, I believe. I think it's like a finger injury or something, but the fact that he's playing is a good sign, so he will build up his fitness. Cam Zerha also reportedly spent a lot of time at centre bounces as well, which is an interesting one. Not sure if that's indicative of you know where they're going to play him this season. He's also a very, very good forward, uh, but either way, he was certainly trialled in that position. For the Tigers, Taranto and Hopper slotted in well. You know, we already know their guns. It's not really a surprise. Taranto drifted forward a little bit. Again, another interesting player who can play midfield and forward. It'll be interesting to see how that balance works this year with Cochin and Martin also rotating with him. Long story short, only a few noteworthy points from this particular game. And I don't know how much to take out of the result, but I suppose North can find it promising that they didn't get absolutely rolled like they would have done last year. They beat Richmond last year. Forget I said that. Next, we'll talk about the Saints and the D's who uh, battled at RSEA Park. Find out what it means to me. Uh, Melbourne won by 59 points, 105 to 46. So a pretty easy victory, um, as you'd sort of expect. This game kind of went to script, depending on your view of St. Kilda, but we know how good Melbourne is. Um, but apparently Clayton Oliver and Petrarca played just as hard as they would for a normal premiership game. I probably just insight into their mindset as athletes. Petrarca kicked three goals. One of the most noteworthy parts of this game was Lockie Hunter uh, played really, really well in his new club as well, obviously. Sort of got shifted from the Bulldogs to the Ds. Had a, a raft of issues at the Bulldogs. We know he's a good player and he's come in and slotted really, really well for the Ds. He was traded for just a future third, so if he can come in and be a best 22 player, that's an automatic bargain for Melbourne as well. You've also had the Ruck situation, which is interesting. Apparently, Gorn spent more time in the Ruck than Grundy, which kind of goes against what some people were suggesting. Grundy would predominantly be the, the Ruckman, and Gorn would maybe play a bit more forward, and then second Ruck. I don't know how many minutes Grundy played, so I don't know if it's indicative, but apparently Gorn was predominantly in the Ruck. It's worth noting from a St. Kilda perspective that they were horribly uh, undermanned, particularly in their forward line. There's no Max King. I think he had a shoulder injury. Hayes is also missing with, uh, I think, a foot. And Membry is also out. So the three tall pillars there of their forward line, Hayes, King, and Membry, all miss this game. So it's tough to, uh, to, to beat Melbourne with players missing like that. 
I think King is unlikely to be back until round seven, which is a massive blow, although Membry is considered a chance to play round one. So either way, the Saints have to figure out a bit of a solution with the absence of Max King. Injury news got a little bit worse. Uh, Jack Billings played in the reserves game after this, which I think was probably like the fifth and sixth quarters. Um, apparently fractured a leg as well. So uh, that's a bit of a blow. He might be out for eight weeks, but on the positive side, uh, Mateus Philippou, uh, one of my favorite players from last year's draft, if you watch my draft content last year, um, played well on a half forward flank, kicked a couple of goals, took a couple of big grabs. Ryan Burns also played well, and Wanganine, Wanganine Miller... I'm going to try that again. Wanganine Miller played well from a halfback flank. Fremantle then played Adelaide at Coburn here in Western Australia. Um, obviously, preseason games don't mean much, and Adelaide won this game by 11 points. And I like to say they don't mean much, but when it's Fremantle and they lose, I think it does mean something. I'm kidding, of course. Apparently, Freo kicked four of the first f uh, five goals of this game, and then the Crows sort of got on top. Hard to read too much into this. Like I said, there's so many rotations going on, and players tried new roles as well. So not taking too much out of the result, but we did see uh, an exciting sort of glimpse into Adelaide's new forward line. Rankin came in and kicked three goals. His first game for the club as well. Fogarty and Himmelberg also kicked a couple of goals, and Shane McAdam is another small forward that the Crows have got there. And you add on Josh Rochelle as well. So a hallmark of the Adelaide side that was good, you know, around that 2017 period when they nearly won the premiership, sort of nearly won the premiership. Uh, again, their forward line is proving to be potentially a big strength again. As far as midfielders go, Sam Berry and Rory Laird were reportedly strong. Sam Berry is quietly becoming a pretty decent midfielder, a little bit understated. And interestingly as well, Josh Rosselli apparently spent a lot of time at center bounces as well. So perhaps the transition of him into more of a midfielder forward is the pathway for his development. I suppose when you've got Rankin and McAdam as forwards as well, it's good to have another player with a bit of versatility. For Frio, we saw Luke Jackson and Jago O'Meara in purple for the first time. And uh, Jago O'Meara was reported very, very prominent, winning a heap of clearances for the Dockers. Luke Jackson played sort of second fiddle ruck and rotated forward as well and kicked a goal as well. Fife is now fully, you know, permanently a full-time forward now. He's relinquished the captaincy. Fremantle's midfield is, you know, very, very young and very strong. It's only going to get better with a couple of players they have uh, coming up through the waffle as well. But now Fife is full-time a sort of medium-sized marking forward, and he kicked three goals, which is really, really promising as well. So if he becomes the sort of player who can kick 35 to 40 goals, sort of replace Lobb's output, that would be a big plus for Fremantle's premiership hopes, I guess, over the next couple of years. The final game we'll talk about is Essendon, who played Gold Coast at Carrara and they ended up winning the game by five points. We had a few notable players missing. Stringer, Nick Cox, and uh, their new draftee, Sardis, didn't play. Uh, and for Gold Coast, Took Miller, uh, Brandon Ellis, Sam Collins, Lockie Weller, and Will Powell also missed. So quite a few good players missing from both sides. From an Essendon perspective, the small forwards were, I guess, kind of perceived as a little bit of a weakness for Essendon um, over the last year or so. But I think they worked pretty well in this game. We saw uh, Alwyn Davy Jr. play his first game. I think he kicked a goal, and Tipper is also back into that side as well. He kicked a goal as well. But there's also Jai Menzi, who was a mid-season draftee last year. He's a 180-centimeter sort of forward. He was one of the better players in red and black in the game as well. Kicked three goals and applied a heap of pressure, and that was one thing that was noted about this game. Essendon did a great job of locking the ball inside 50. From a Gold Coast perspective, Bailey Humphrey, their number six draft pick in last year's draft, has been much talked about, a chance for round one. Described as he couldn't have done more to impress. Obviously, I didn't actually watch this game, but more just trying to find the noteworthy points for you. He played as a forward mid, as we'd expect, and uh, considered a really good chance to play for round one. So that's exciting news for Gold Coast fans, and it's also interesting to note if you've got your fantasy team in the back of your mind too. Sam Flanders is probably a player that needs a bit of a big year. I think he's in a contract year as well and ended the year last year in their side and uh, will probably need a big year this year, but he apparently kicked two and contributed in the midfield as well. So that's a good sign for him. And we also saw Charlie Constable, uh, who's joined Gold Coast, shifted more into a halfback role and uh, apparently that worked well during this game as well. So another decent mid-priced option potentially for your fantasy team because he does know how to find the footy. Other than that, not sure how much to take from this game. Uh, there were no major injuries, although Essendon's run Nick Bryan did come off with a sore ankle, but I think he just rolled it and he's going to be all right. Anyway, guys, that's probably all the noteworthy stuff from the uh, the round of preseason games. We got another one this weekend. Again, I'll try and do one of these videos for you. Should be no problem. 
It's exciting time. I'm glad footy's back. Um, I do have my wisdom teeth out next week, but I'll, uh, I'm sure I'll be making several videos before that time as well. But after that, it's not long until round one. I think only like three weeks away from now. It's exciting. It's great to be making content again. I appreciate you guys being here. Let me know in the comments what you agreed with or what you disagree with or something that you found interesting from this week's games um, that I potentially missed. It'd be great for me to learn as well because I obviously couldn't have watched all of them. But thanks for your time, guys. I appreciate all the support and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.